wanted to start off with is just what is ecotourism? Um, and the problem is uh, there is an actual definition for ecotourism. Uh, it is responsible travel to natural areas that conserves the environment, sustains the well-being of local people, and involves interpretation and education. Um, there are concepts, and, and ecotourism can be all kinds of things. Uh, we've got the zip line and hunter, we've got trails, we've got skiing, we've got the interpretive center. We have parts of these programs, um, but what I wanted to say is if you look at those five bullets down at the bottom, um, really the tenets of ecotourism are minimizing impact, building environmental and cultural awareness, providing positive experiences for visitors and hosts here in the Catskills, providing direct financial benefits for conservation, and also providing financial benefits and empowerment of the local people. So thinking of tourism here in the Catskills, does anyone think that we meet all of those items? So, we, so what I wanted to say is we talk a lot about ecotourism in the Catskills, um, but how are we actually doing in terms of meeting that definition of ecotourism? Now, I tried to do it as green is good, we're meeting it. Yellow, we still need work. Red, not at all. And I think we can all see that there's no green on the list. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to do. Um, one of the biggest problems that we're having is we're not minimizing impacts. Um, I think that everybody is aware that the Catskills are becoming more popular. Um, and instead of being able to minimize the impacts, the impacts are actually growing. Uh, we have trash problems across the Catskills. We have traffic problems in some places. We have trailheads and um, trail destinations where hundreds or thousands of people are congregating and uh, destroying the environment in the process. Um, do we, does anyone, you know, there's great examples like here at the Ashokan Center or at the Catskill Center's Catskill Interpretive Center where we are trying to build environmental and cultural awareness. But again, a lot of our tourism, it's just get up here and recreate in the outdoors. Um, we're taking the benefits of outdoor recreation, but we're not necessarily tying that into the concept of ecotourism. And then I do think we are starting to, to work on other items where um, things are happening here in the Catskills where experiences are changing for visitors. Um, they are becoming positive experiences. I can remember uh, growing up in the Catskills, you probably had uh, a minor stroke of luck if you were able to eat on a Tuesday night um, in the region. Um, nowadays, there's a few more restaurants that are open on Tuesday nights. So when somebody comes up here to have a recreation kind of weekend, uh, you know, or be a tourist for a week, they can receive experiences that are very positive. And we have businesses that have come in that focus number one on customer service and the, and the, the uh, visitor experience. Like I think of a place like the Roxbury uh, Hotel, amazingly focused on customer service and the customer experience. I think that we are starting to see some benefits coming back to conservation. Um, that's mostly been through advocacy work. We've been saying we need more resources because we have more people coming here. Um, but in terms of ecotourism, that's actually thinking about how do the activities that people are engaging in financially return back to the conservation of the resource that they're taking advantage of and they're coming to see. And so I think it's pretty clear um, we don't have a lot of instances where uh, you know you go on the zip line at Hunter Mountain, Hunter Mountain is not making a donation towards forest preserve protection. Um, and so uh, we probably have quite, we still have work to do, but at least we're starting to think about that, that you can't just use the resource without returning to it. And I think another place where we've started to see some, some change and some positivity is providing financial benefits and empowerment for local people. We're seeing an explosion of small business across the Catskills. Um, there's a lot of people that are just um, seeing opportunities and taking, taking that opportunity. Um, something that we didn't see 10, 15, 20 years ago here in the Catskills. Um, so we're starting to see that, but there are also not organizations like say like the Catskill Center or say uh, government agencies or, or towns and communities where we're providing the structure that makes that kind of action easier. So we're gonna talk a little bit more as we go into it, but what I really wanted to start with was, you know, there is the concept of ecotourism. 
Um, I think that it is a great goal, and it is the goal that we should have for tourism here in the Catskills. However, our tourism is not ecotourism currently. Um, you know, we don't meet the definition of ecotourism. If anything, we're just saying, folks, come to the Catskills, you know, and, and uh, without much thought for the environment. So it's actually um, a bit of anti-ecotourism right now. But that's not to say that this can change. Um, and that as long as we're aware of what is happening, uh, there are organizations and there are individuals and there are agencies that are working uh, to make this more of, a, uh, more of a reality versus just a, a goal. And, and I guess I would say why should ecotourism work here in the Catskills? Um, generally when you think of ecotourism destinations, uh, they are unique natural areas. Uh, everybody hears about the, uh, the rainforest explorations in Costa Rica or going on a safari in Africa where it's, it's this regenerative ecotourism. Um, and it works because there's this incredible natural area that offers all these opportunities for people and also offers opportunities for the people that are living around that unique natural area to take advantage of the visitors and do that in a sustainable way. Looking at the Catskills, we have more than 300,000 acres of state land, which is the forever wild forest lands. Huge resource. We have 150,000 plus acres of watershed lands. There's millions of acres of private land that are rough, you know, generally in a, in a pretty natural state. So we have millions of acres when you look at the whole Catskill region that are more or less pristine natural areas that really just drive people. They have a a feeling that the Catskills are natural. Um, we have, you know, marketing programs where we're saying pure Catskills. You know, if you, you come here, things are clean, they're natural. Um, so that's why people are coming here. Uh, and the other reason people are coming here because we are the closest natural escape to 12 plus million people um, that are, you know, within a five hour drive of the Catskills, you have pretty much the greatest population density of the United States. Uh, which is an incredible concept, you know, here you are in the middle of the Catskill Park and two and a half hours south, there you are in Manhattan. Um, and so that is really the driver for why ecotourism should work. It should work because we have a park, we have protected lands. Um, unlike other parks in America, the Catskill Park is a quilt work patch, patchwork of public and private lands. Um, there are no other parks other than the Adirondack Park here in New York in the United States where public and private land intermix. Um, so you have you know, this unique opportunity to have a community within the park and within that natural preserved area. So you could be hiking slide and you could be then having dinner in Phoenicia um, or you know, whatever it may be. And there is a, a growing, I think we've all seen it, we see it in the the marketing and advertising that's being done for the Catskills and for, I think, places in general. Newer generations are seeing a strong desire to reconnect with nature. Um, and also, given the economies and things that are happening, people like to vacation closer to home. Um, so when we have a population center as big as we do a few hours away, uh, and we have that place where they can reconnect with nature, and we have that place that's you know, within a, an afternoon drive, um, we're bound to start seeing increasing levels of tourism here in the Catskills. So right now, we're seeing those increased levels, um, and we are trying to figure out the mechanisms to make ecotourism work. And I'll just add, if anybody, we're such a small group, if, if anybody wants to ask questions or anything, hop in. Some of the economic opportunities that exist here in the Catskills that make us primed for ecotourism um, is that our economy is already based a lot around things that are related to ecotourism. So we've got agriculture. We have a service industry. We've always had a service industry since 1820 something when you know, the great hotels started to open up. Um, we've always been a place of outdoor recreation. Um, and we have, you know, some other industries. Um, I, I put forestry because some people are interested in seeing how these, these industries interact and they can be part of that ecotourism experience. Um, we're never going to be a place that, you know, IBM is going to build a giant uh, manufacturing plant or 
Um, you know, there are too many regulations, there's too many um, reasons why heavy industry won't come to the Catskills, um, if only because it's hard to get around the Catskills. Um, and so these have always been drivers and they will continue to be the drivers and they actually set us up perfectly to be taking advantage of ecotourism opportunities in the future. And I just want to reiterate, some people think tourism is, you know, tourists and visitors are so bad right now that it's, you know, where are they coming from? Well, we have had tourism since basically time immemorial or since the beginning of our nation. Um, we were America's first wilderness. Um, we were seen as that escape from the grime and the dirt of the early 1800s New York City. Um, you know, for as miserable as a hot summer day is in New York City right now, can you imagine a hot summer day in 1815 when everything is being heated by coal, all of, you know, trains are doing whatever they're doing, it's just dirty, it's grimy, it's sooty, it's hot, it's humid, it probably smelled really bad. Um, you know, there was just a whole host of reasons that if you were of means, you were like, see you later, New York City. Um, and that led to the rise of the great hotels. Um, this is the Catskill Mountain House there on the, on the left. There was hundreds of these, these hotels, you know, only a few dozen you know, super grand hotels, but hundreds of boarding houses, places to stay. Um, it makes Airbnb look insignificant today. Um, you know, there were thousands of rooms, um, and they were full. Uh, people could take trains, there was train service. Uh, throughout a lot of the Catskills. Um, and so you could take a steamboat up to uh, up the Hudson River, you could hop out onto a train, you could take the train over to the Otis Railroad, Elevating Railroad, ride the Elevating Railroad right up to the Catskill Mountain House. From there you could actually hop on a train that would take you back out through Hunter and Tannersville, down through Stony Clove Notch, down to Phoenicia, down to the Ulster and Delaware on, on Route 28, and then you could you know interconnect with the railroad networks there. And you know, at the time, nature was harnessed for these visitors. Um, so if you see pictures of places like Caterskill Falls and things like that, you know, they had a dam on Caterskill Falls, so if you paid your nickel uh, at, you know, one time a day, they'd open the dam up, the falls would, you know, come, come roaring over, and everybody would cheer. Um, and so nature was really a, a very strong element of, you know, that, that tourist activity. Around the same time, we also had the Hudson River School. Um, who started to paint the landscapes of the Catskills and who really started to create, and I, that was the first identity of wilderness and of naturalness in America. Um, before that, you know, we didn't have a, a homegrown landscape painting um, school or, or sort of train of thought. Um, and they really started to crystallize in the consciousness of our nation that there is this unique wild character. And it just so happened that the Hudson Valley and the Catskills were the place where that started. So um, I like to tell people New York's the, the f uh, state of many firsts, and I think that you know, in, in many ways we can take credit for creating a sense of wilderness and creating a sense of American landscape, which then helped create this sense of modern conservation, which then helped create the modern environmental movement, which was crystallized in the Hudson Valley over fights over uh, issues down in the Hudson Highlands. And so, um, you know, you can trace right from, from the paintings and the, the, the era of that uh, great hotel period in the Catskills right to, to the modern day. Then, you know, we had, uh, some people call it the Borscht Belt or, you know, the, the resorts of the Catskills in the, in the 40s and the 50s. Um, and again, pretty crowded, um, large groups of people. Um, and what has happened is between each of these periods, and there's many smaller bumps and valleys in between, but you know, it's, it's sort of a rolling, you know, we'll have a very busy tourism period, then it kind of peters off and people forget that there used to be tourists, and then suddenly tourists are back, and then it's, it's a big deal. Um, this is an example today of the tourism problem that we're facing. Um, yes, yes, yep. So what I would say is, you know, in 1980, a busy day at Blue Hole, or even in 1990, or even in 2000 and 2005, 2008, 2009, a busy day at Blue Hole was 20 people, maybe. 
a busy day at Blue Hole, and this is only a snapshot of one corner of Blue Hole, is five, six, seven hundred people. But you know, we do have different, I guess, technological aspects today that sort of put tourism on, on steroids in, in a way. But if you watch the Travel Channel, yeah. it's one of the top 10 American swimming holes. Caterskill fought, like I don't have a picture of Caterskill, but Caterskill is the same problem. It's, you know, you, you, there's all this stuff that it's like, this is the place to come. I, I, sort, of, I sort of imagine it when, when I try to talk to people about this. You know, it's kind of that, it's Blue Hole and Caterskill are actually great examples. They're like the two places that even if you know nothing about the Catskills, you probably have somehow heard that there's this amazing swimming hole and there's this really tall waterfall that's the tallest waterfall in New York and you, you gotta go to it. And it's, it's like the most famous trail in a national park that when you, you, know, you come to the national park, you're like, oh my God, I gotta do X. And so everybody goes and does X. And no matter what we do, people are gonna wanna come and do X. Um, but to answer your question about what's being done, um, there have been special regulations that have been passed. Um, so there is now a, a, a repairing corridor area where glass is not allowed, uh, cooking equipment, because there was actually, you can see it, there's barbecues and stuff in there. Um, there's no open alcohol containers. There's, there's a whole host of special regulations that we're trying to kind of get at the, the heart of these groups of people. Another issue is that um, it is a specific um, ethnic group that, that uses uh, this, um, that the, uh, the area of the world that they come from, this is often how families enjoy a weekend as they go and, and have a stream. And it's actually, it's a very distinct group uh, from a very distinct area in New York City. And so what one thing that is happening is that uh, DEC and uh, the nonprofit groups like the Catskill Center we're reaching out to uh, the, the state legislators for that district, um, and we're also reaching out to the, uh, the matriarchs and the patriarchs of those families to say, you know, we love the fact that you're coming to the Catskills and, you know, we want you to have a good time, but we also can't have you leaving your barbecues in the river and leaving trash and not using the outhouse and all that kind of stuff. But they're really, you know, the, the honest to goodness truth is there's no good solution until we want to get serious about uh, improving our infrastructure. Because, you know, in a place that people want to go that only has 25 parking spots that can only hold maybe comfortably that 25 people that we're coming to visit, um, you have to make it so that you can create the situation to manage the use. And the thing about the Catskill Park and the Forest Preserve, it's a bit of an open park, or it is an open park. Uh, we don't have gates, you know, we don't, uh, say, okay, 100 people have come in, gates closed, you know, sorry, you can't come in. Uh, it's kind of a, a self-managing process, and the self-managing procedures that used to work, like keeping parking lots small, um, you know, not necessarily providing lots of access to different places, you know, for here at Blue Hole, there's no parking, so they just park on the road, and, you know, the town of Denning had, I think, like 2,000 parking tickets last year. Um, and so that you know, the they like that. well, but they don't because you know they have a judge that works like five hours a week, and uh, a lot of the times they don't. People, you know, if you're from New York City, what's a hundred dollar parking ticket? It's it's they what you, it they don't even have to because it doesn't. It's not oh, our tickets up here in the Catskills are not the tickets that get associated with. With the, so you can't, it, it won't show up when you try to renew your licenses. Oh, okay. They are working on that. Generally the Forest Preserve is a carried in, carried out park just because of the massive amounts. And again, socioeconomic, ethnic groups coming from New York City, um, you know, what I will say is um, they are conditioned to an experience in the metropolitan region. So if you go and you have a picnic in Central Park, quite often when you're finished, you take your trash and you pile it up next to the trash can and you expect the park maintenance people to come and take it away. Um, people have been asked, why are you leaving trash? Mm -hmm. And they've told the people, well, we don't want to put the, the park people out of business. You know, we so want to, we, and so, you know, so up. it's, it's not, I caution people to, you know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in not calling people stupid 
or you know, ignorant. It's just that um, you have to think if somebody has spent their life in New York City um, and has never come to the Catskills before, never been to a wild area, they're not going to know the rules of the road like we know the rules of the road. It's very easy for us to say, oh my gosh, why would you wear flip-flops to the top of Caterskill Falls? But if you have no reason to, you've spent your life wearing flip-flops walking around, around Manhattan, it doesn't seem like a, a huge problem until it is a problem. When you look at, look at the history and sort of how we got to where we are, because a lot of everything that we have is because of you know, those very first efforts. Basically the entire ranger force and environmental conservation officer force and state police force and the town of Denning police force are there every weekend in the summertime. So if there is an emergency somewhere else, um, you know, there is now trouble because everybody is there being that valet parker in a way, you know, and trying to, to manage that use. We don't have enough manpower to tackle, you know, two or three blue holes. Um, and so that's a problem. I think what's the problem today is that it's just the number of people. Right. So, so Blue Hole, a busy day, 10 years ago was 25 people. A busy day at Blue Hole today is 500 to 1,000 people in a single day. And literally people are standing like, you know, like this next to each other, looking at the water, and they're not even really swimming. They're, they're all sort of... Right. Well, and so, you know, kind of think back to those tenets of ecotourism that we first looked at, you know, is anything that's happening at the Blue Hole providing benefits to conservation? No. no. Is, is anything that's happening in Blue Hole empowering local businesses and invi individuals? No. No. Um, no. 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 Oh, yes. You know, they're, but they're probably buying it, yeah. you know. I often laugh that they prob they probably the only economic impact they've made is buying the liquor bef at the local yeah. liquor store before they, they go into the blue hole. But even that, maybe they bring it up from the city. Who knows? Um, so I, our, our, the beginning of the it was, you know, ecotourism is a very defined thing. And we are nowhere near ecotourism here in the Catskills. I would go back to these tenants, you know. Is, is, is our tourism today minimizing impacts? No. Are we, are those people that are using Blue Hole, are they learning about the environment and, and uh, the culture here in the Catskills and learning to respect it? No. Um, are we providing positive experiences for visitors and hosts? No, but you know. there are clusters, aren't there? There are clusters of where areas where they're abusing it. Yes. And there are some places, and that's why I, I, I think in these two aspects, we're not doing anything um, coherently to help the environment. We're in a challenging area because it is forest preserve. There are constitutional New York State protections for our forest preserve. Article 14 of the New York State Constitution says, you know, these lands shall be forever wild. They won't be sold. They won't be uh, developed. They won't be used for commercial activities. Um, there's a certain development that's allowed, but then there's a certain level of development that's not allowed over that. So, you know, in a perfect world, a place like Blue Hole, you would probably improve that site. Because I, what I say is you can, in a place like Caterskill Falls or in Blue Hole, these are places that are going to be popular. And you have to build the infrastructure at these places to manage the people, to protect the environment that, you're, that people are coming to see. Um, this stairway at, at Caterskill Falls is actually a great example. Um, years, years, decades, this was just how people sort of scrambled up the slope to get to the upper tier to get up behind Caterskill Falls. Three years ago, that place looked like a war zone. You know, it, there was nothing living, there was just scree. They've built this staircase, everybody uses this staircase now. There is nobody walking up on the scree and walking on the stuff. Little trees are starting to come back. Uh, grass is starting to grow. Um, so, you know, here at Caterskill, we were able to find an engineered solution um, to at least stop the resource degradation. Um, people still get hurt. People still, get hurt. Um, people still will do silly things, um, and people will still leave trash, and people, you know. But 
that one solution, which cost half a million dollars, all the improvements at Cater Skill Falls in the last two years cost about a half a million dollars. So it's not a, a small amount of money to, to sneeze at. But you know, sort of an, another aspect, uh, this, this providing direct financial benefits for conservation, the sad fact is when you pay day use fees for forest preserve, so like if you uh, go to a campground and you pay the, the $5 to get into the campground or you, there's some parking lots that you have to pay to use around the Catskills, that money goes into the New York State General Fund never to be seen by the Forest Preserve. Um, and so that money is not regenerating back into um, the things and you know, being sort of an, uh, a person involved in the political process, it would be like moving heaven and earth to, to not have it go into the, in the general fund. But you know, those are challenges. Um, the Adirondack Mountain Club and the Catskill, Mount, uh, the Catskill Center has worked with the Leave No Trace Institute. Um, and Blue Hole has been designated as the 2017 hotspot um, of the nation. So leave, the Leave No Trace organization is pouring all of its resources for like a three week stretch um, into Blue Hole. Uh, and they're actually gonna be part of the outreach down to the communities um, because they've worked with you know, gangs in Los Angeles that have been using the Los Angeles National Forest for nefarious things and stuff like that. See, so there's hope. There's the there, there, there is hope, you know? Right, right. Well, and it's fine, you know, for the specific community here, it's, it's finding the, the matriarchs and the patriarchs that can, you know, say, what are you doing? And, and, and that actually, you know, I'm, I'm not super familiar with it, but I'm told by the people in the know that that's, it can be as simple as that, but it's, it's putting the time and effort to figure out who do we go talk to um, and, and to make that, that change. So I think one solution for Blue, for Blue Hole you know, they've already started to do improvements there. There's now a more defined trail to Blue Hole. There's kiosks that are saying, you know, this water goes into the reservoir, which goes into the New York City drinking water. It's bilingual, so that it's, you know, we, we tend to make a, a presumption that everybody speaks English that comes to the Catskills if you look at most of our signage. Not the case. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, and so I think, I think thing, there's small things, but you know what I would love to see is finding a way. I think that there are places that are just going to be overused and are going to be overenjoyed. And unfortunately or fortunately, depending on where you fall on the constitutional disagreements, um, we, we can't institute certain things that would make it easier and are probably done at other places where there is a more direct ecotourism benefit. Like if we charge people five bucks to, to come to Blue Hole, well then you know what, we would have an amazingly clean Blue Hole and we would have staff working there because they'd be paid by that five bucks. And, but unfortunately, it's just not gonna happen that way. But nonprofits, NGOs can step in and, and try to fill in the gap. I guess that's where my thoughts are headed too. Um, it sounds like we're almost saying that there may need to be a, a conscious redevelopment of the infrastructure for recreational tourism done like there, like there used to exist mm -hmm. 100 years ago. Um, in my mind, that would need to involve a lot of discussion with the residents of, of the Catskills, the people who live here and use it. I know they're keeping stuff secret off, <laughs> off the internet as much as they can. They're trying. Yeah. yeah. But so that they're use values are taken into consideration as well. Uh, but how is, how is this going to happen with the forever wild, you know, we, we right. you know, and I think. And where is the discussion at with DEC and DEP? Um, so DE, DEP actually in this regard is probably easier to work with because their lands don't have the, the limitations that are in, uh, in place by the Constitution. Um, but even DEC, I think, is recognizing that, uh, because they're facing the same problems in the Adirondacks. Um, the Adirondack Park and the Catskill Park are being discovered, so to speak. Um, and they're having keg parties on top of, you know, the high peaks of the Adirondacks. Um, yeah, but I don't know. I, I have the ambassador. Well, who, I don't, you know, I, in my mind, hiking a keg up a mountain doesn't sound like very much fun, but, right, but, People do it, you know. And I also think there's, there's, not to go too far afield, but there's sort of a change in the concept. Uh, I think me, speaking of my generation and, and uh, generations before me, I think that we saw wilderness and the outdoors as sort of a, uh, 
uh, a means of themselves. Like we went out to enjoy the outdoors. Um, younger generations, um, there seems to be an aspect of physical activity or challenge associated with the outdoors that it's not so much like, oh, I'm going up a peak and there's an amazing view. It's just, oh, I am able to check this off my checklist and I've done the, gr I've done the grid or I've done the 3,500 or... Yeah. Yeah. Well. Well, right here at home, not, no, no knocks on the Catskill 3500 Club, but this is a club that you know uh, recommends to people that they climb the 35 highest peaks of the Catskills. Uh, probably half of those are trailless peaks. Um, each year, they've seen like doubling, tripling of the number of people that are claiming that they've hiked all the peaks. And if you go to any of these trailless peaks now. You'll see that actually none of our trellis peaks are trellis anymore. Um, you know, there's herd paths right to the top. And so, you know, a club that's doing a great thing and, you know, their mission and their, their vision is, you know, protecting the Catskill wilderness, but in the aspect of doing that, they're actually harming the wilderness that, that they're trying to protect. Because everybody, everybody takes the same compass bearing from the parking lot and, you know, eventually over time. Right. So right. Do, you make, do you make it a trail, or do you just leave them all to be multiple yeah. trails that aren't really trails? <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of growing tourism, you know, I think there's multiple reasons why uh, we're feeling a bit um, under pressure here in the Catskills. Um, number one is that this governor and this administration um, really sees the economic importance of tourism. Um, I think as soon as Governor Cuomo took office, we all started seeing the I Love New York ads again. Uh, we see the ESD, you know, New York on the move ads constantly. Um, plus, he's just a guy that likes the outdoors. He's a fisherman. He likes to raft. He does all these but, you things. Know, that's also our economy. Yes. That's what we only have here. That's right. So what do you do? Right. Are you going to make a factory in Ellenville again, or are you going to maybe do something that's right. environmental? Yeah. And for actually for much of New York State, it's this it's and it's this is not new this right. is not unique to the Catskills. This right. is you know okay, so Southern Tier. What do they have going for them other than people wanting to come to the Finger Lakes? You know, mm -hmm. tourism in New York used to focus all on New York City. Um, you know, it was come to New York City, come to New York City. Our tourism, if you look at I Love New York and and such, it is now directing people. We've seen the Catskill ads, we've seen the Adirondack ads, and those are not just ads that we're advertising to ourselves, those are international ad buys that are, you know, saying come to upstate New York. Like I said, the governor is an outdoor guy. He started his first, his first year in office, he started the Adirondack Challenge where he spent a day and a half taking part in all the different outdoor activities in the Adirondacks. Uh, through the hard work of the Catskill Center and others, we convinced him to also have a Catskill Challenge. Um, uh, and he wanted to go rafting, and I was kind of like, where does one raft in the, in the Catskills? But apparently there's a little section of the Delaware right down by Pennsylvania where you can, you can go rafting, and so we did that. <laughs> I suggested that. It, I, think, I think the state police probably shot down the tubing idea. <laughs> um, we also, uh, we have had um, sort of ebbs and flows of regional tourism too. We're in a period where we are having a fairly strong regional uh, tourism promotion uh, group. This is Visit the Catskills, if anybody's familiar with the, the four county consortium. It's, it's actually called the Catskill Area Tourism Services, which is CATS, if you ever hear that acronym. And it's not for the Catskills, it's for, for the tourism. So we have a state level, national, international campaign, and then we have the Visit the Catskills regional campaign, which uh, generally is a, a statewide and a, a, a national-wide uh, promotional program. Um, we've seen lots of videos shared of waterfalls and all these things, and actually one challenge we have, me at the Catskill Center, I see this stuff, I forward it to the folks at DEC, and I'm like, why is, Empire, why is I Love New York and Empire State Development sharing a person dangling their feet off Caterskill Falls? You know, and so then, you know, so there's, you know, we're, we're not, we're sending mixed messages, I guess, in there too. And then also there's a changing nature of the people that are coming to visit us. 
um, people are not as interested in um, you know the resorts of the 1950s. Let's say they were coming up to just you know be at a resort and have that resort experience. People are coming up here today to escape. Um, the mountains, the Catskills are seen as this natural area. Um, you can go and, and uh, take part in farming activities and get your hands dirty. You know, people are looking, you know, to some of us it may not seem like a vacation if you have to go and work at a farm for, for a week, but people are coming up and there's entire businesses growing up around having people come up and help with the farm. So that really is an ecotourism. That is totally yeah. an ecotourism, you know, thing. It, completely regenerative for the region, you know, providing kind of a, well, they're getting paid for labor um, in a way. Uh, um, and, and also, you know, for whatever people say about uh, the Catskills being uh, not a wilderness and not a natural area, there are too many to count vistas like this and experiences like this in the Catskills. So people can come here a few hours of travel in a car, not needing to take a plane to somewhere, and they have a great experience. And then the other, the other thing I would say is we are becoming a bit of the playground, once again, of New York City. Um, so uh, I find it amazing that people will come up and stay in a modified you know, motor lodge and spend $300 a night for a room. Uh, but they are, you know? And uh, we've all gone to restaurants, I'm sure, if we're all locals, and you look at the prices and you're like, who is paying this, this money for this stuff? And so clearly there's a different demographic that is, that is coming up and there's enjoying sure. that. But I also think that one aspect of today's rebirth of tourism is that in probably five years ago back, we were very limited by places to stay in the Catskills. Uh, the rise of Airbnb um, has really revolutionized uh, people visiting the Catskills because they're not they're not forced to have to to use a hotel to stay and enjoy the place. Um, I'm consistently shocked. I go to the Pika Moose restaurant um, in Big Indian, which is you know when you look at a map of the Catskills, it's kind of the middle of nowhere. And on a Monday night, it's open, and this place is packed every time. So clearly, people are staying at all of these Airbnb. Yeah, yeah. Tavern 214, yeah. Table on 10, out in, in uh, oh, is it Bloomville? No. Like, you know, you're, you're driving and you're like, where am I? And you look at the outside of the place, you're like, where am I? And you go in and it is hopping, like, you know, or Brushlands Eating House, you know, all these places that are, are popping up clearly show that, you know, we have, uh, I guess, a, a, a critical mass of, of people staying in the Catskills but we need systematic efforts to educate people. Like think about when you visit a national park, how often are you bombarded by messages to do the right thing in the national park? Or like smoking a bit, I mean we all just right. like, you know, oh, you give a hoot, don't pollute, you know? Who, who yeah. still remembers the owl? And you know, you wanna throw something, you're like, oh, I don't, you know. You, know, you gotta be banged over the head and we have no systematic, we have no systematic you know, ways to bang people over the head here in the Catskills. From our successful tourism, this is all the things that we've been talking about. There's, there's overuse, there's trash. We're actually degrading the resources that people are coming up, whether it's water quality or whether it's just uh, trampling vegetation. Um, Woodstock is a great example of parking problems. But almost everywhere, it's amazing. Like, um, my folks own a house um, in Platte Clove, which is the trailhead for the Devil's Path. Um, there's finally a parking lot, which we're very grateful for. They used to park in our front yard. But a busy, a busy weekend back, you know, 20 years ago, I think the record my dad would count was like maybe 30 cars down along the road. When they built the parking lot about, I guess, 15 years ago now, they built it for 35 cars because we were like, well, we never see more than 30 cars. Like Memorial Day weekend would be our busy weekend or maybe July 4th weekend we would never see more than 30 cars. And we'd be like, oh my God, a banner weekend, 30 cars. Yeah. So 15 years ago, when the state said, we're gonna build a parking lot, and we're gonna put it, you know, they, they built the parking lot, they built a road that takes the traffic Basically, up into the first. Did they, ask you, did they ask you? Yes, but they asked us, they're like, well, you know, you keep records, 
what's the maximum number of cars that you've seen? And we're like, well, if you built a parking lot for 35 cars, it'll never fill up. Like, you know, within a few years, it started to fill up. Now, it's on a, just like probably this weekend, it's probably overflowing. Or we have a big dog, and so it's much easier to walk the dog during the week because there's not people. Yeah. But more and more, you go to a trail that nobody would be using during the week, and now you run into people. So the two things that we haven't talked about um, that I think are challenges, and I think that uh, go back to our tenants of ecotourism, Right now, much of this use, there is no coherent connection to main streets and to communities here in the Catskills. So people are coming to these very popular places. They are doing whatever they're doing. Then they're getting in their cars and they're driving home. Um, they're not stopping in, in the village to buy a hamburger. They're not uh, doing whatever they're doing that tourists would be doing to be spending money. Not, not to any extent that's making an impact. And also, um, Part of the reason is there's an incomplete uh, system of visitor services to engage these people. So it, it was July 2015 that the Catskill Interpretive Center opened, which is the first official visitor center for the Catskill Park. It took 30 plus years to get to that. Um, you know, these are all long processes, but they really uh, show how the lack of that service has impacted us here in the Catskills because we don't have a clearinghouse. We don't have a place that people come and then they get sent out, but now they do, so. Well, what's uh, interesting is like if you go to a national park, the, the visitor center is where everybody stops first to find out information, and that's where you can hit people in the head saying, do this, do this, do this. And the cats will never have that. That's very there's true. Because no, there's no single entry point. Correct. Exactly. We have at least four major gateways to the Catskills, yeah. if, if not more. We're sort of injecting steroids into tourism. Um, but we're not injecting steroids into the stewardship. And what I would say is, you know, we finally have started to get the state to realize that posting an 11 by 17 piece of paper with print this big that lists every environmental statute possible doesn't educate people that are looking at their kiosk. You need, you know, five do this or don't do this kind of messages because I don't think that you can successfully promote the region if you're not also investing in the infrastructure of the park um, and, and, and the regenerative procedures that can help communities. Because it's not, here in the Catskills, it's not just the parklands that are important. It's actually the communities that are also important. Um, and, you know, I think we're all pretty local, right? We've, we've all seen our communities struggle. You know, there's, there's a big challenge and, you know, some would point the finger at the city. I, I don't agree that it's the city's fault. Some would point the finger at the state land. I, I, I think actually the city land and the state land is the reason people are coming here. We're just not providing that connection to why, to why if you're coming up here to recreate and you're taking advantage of these tourism opportunities, why aren't you visiting our main streets? What I would say is, um, there's that old adage that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, there have been many other regions of New York that have been much better squeaky wheels than the Catskills, um, or have incredible legislative champions like Senator Betty Little in the Adirondacks, that nothing happens in the Adirondacks without Senator Little knowing about it. What about that um, mining thing, though? Didn't it, wasn't that a big problem with the <coughs> mining up there? Well, if you look at, look at her affiliation as a, a senator, you'll she wasn't against it. She makes sure that money comes to the Adirondack Park, whether or not that is exactly in our eco thing, but the Adirondacks get significantly more money because they have very strong champions that are making sure, you know, there's the Adirondack portion. So, uh, when I started at the trail conference, uh, I started working with Alan White, who was the executive director of the Catskill Center at the time, and we were saying, we go to these meetings, we talk about the Adirondacks for 99% of the time and the Catskills get short thrift. We try to get money in the budget every year for the Catskills, nothing happens. And we said, what, what are things that we can start doing? So we started Catskill Park Awareness Day, uh, which uh, we got organizations together. We started knocking on legislative doors. We, basically the first Tuesday of February, we all go up and we say we love the Catskills. When we first started doing that, I would meet with legislators 
And they would, I'd do my little spiel, and they'd be like, that's really nice, but where are the Catskills, Jeff? Um, and these were legislators from. Second largest mountain range in New York State. Well, you don't know where the Catskills These were legislators from Westchester. So clearly they were driving past the Catskills when they were going to Albany. Um, so it has taken, it has taken work. Um, the Catskill Center co founded the Catskill Park Coalition. Uh, which is a consortium of about 30 different NGOs here in the Catskills, advocating for the Catskills and raising awareness. Um, each year since we started that six years ago, there have been more resources for the Catskills in each budget. So this year, yes, there was $8 million for Bel Air, but there was also $7 million in stewardship money for the Catskill Park that's going right into trail improvement, that's going into fixing Blue Hole, that's paying for Caterskill Falls, things like that. So. Okay, we have discovered that, yeah. No, no, no. Six years ago, there was zero. Yeah, there was zero dedicated money for the Catskill Park. We're up to seven million dollars right. now. Yeah. Which you? partly. I, I, I'll take credit. It's all because of me. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why you should be a member of the Catskill Center to support our work to do that. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's slow and steady wins the game. Um, and I will say that we do have, um, we are clearly small potatoes, but we do have a good relationship with the governor's office. Um, our legislators here in the Catskills are stepping up. Senator Seward and Senator Amador have been champions for finding that money for the Catskill Park. So uh, also uh, Assemblyman Cahill and Assemblywoman Gunther have been great great partners in just saying, you know, let's get money for the park. Well, what's now at Catskill Park Awareness Day when we walk in, they go, oh, you're the Catskill people. So they're right. remembering us, which is yeah. good. So we're do, you have, do you have a poster of the Catskills? You know, <laughs> things like that. Well, so. so many organizations went to that. 12, 15? <laughs> well, the very first Awareness Day was two organizations. It was the Catskill Center and the Trail Conference. We now have 30 different organizations going up every year. And the Showcan Center was one of the organizations. Last year yeah. there. Good. Yeah. It's a team effort. Yeah. Definitely. Pine Hill Community Center was there. Yeah. Um, it, it's really just an opportunity to, because honestly, that's the answer to your question is just hitting the pavement and knocking on doors and telling people the Catskills are important. Um, personally, I found it incredibly enlightening because I think before I got into the advocacy, you know, legislative stuff, you know, it seemed like a very mysterious mystical thing. I worked in state government before, so I kind of knew like, hey, if certain people complain, suddenly that permit that was on my desk is no longer on my desk and it's issued. Um, but I didn't really understand the concept. But what it is, is concerned citizens and concerned organizations being organized. Perse like I said at the beginning, perseverance pays off. And I think that even a baby step is still a step. Um, and people may say that I'm, I'm too laid back and too easygoing, but I think in terms of this legislative advocacy kind of work, there are times when you need the sledgehammer, but there are also times when just slow and steady wins the game. And it might not be glorious and it might, might be uh, discouraging at times. Like there's been years where we had money one year and then the next year we didn't have as much. Seven million is the most that we've had so far. So, so there are two scenic byways in the park now. There's the Mountain Close Scenic Byway, which is uh, Route 23A, um, and several other roads in the town of Hunter. So basically like Caterskill Clove, Platte Clove, and, and a few other roads. Um, and then there is the uh, Catskill Mountain Scenic Byway, which runs from Olive to Andes on Route 28. Um, that is, you know, at its heart, Scenic Byway is just a federal and state DOT definition um, that there are certain scenic qualities um, and that they're being recognized by that designation. Um, the designation itself doesn't bring any regulatory power uh, to, to the communities or to the agencies. Uh, it's basically saying to a town planning board or a town board, like, hey, you're on the scenic byway, so you should probably give a little extra look at a project that's you know, happening on your byway. Um, there is more funding available. Um, by being a officially designated byway, there is money available for projects. Um, Generally, both byways are in the process right now of figuring out signage and kiosks and introductions and websites and brochures. And so it's, 
it's basically another way to tell a story about a certain experience that you may have, in this case, driving. You know, you, Mo. Well, don't haven't they done studies that if there's a scenic highway, people will drive the whole thing because it's like something right. to do. Yeah. And so it, it connects different communities. You know, New York State publishes maps that are like, you know, the scenic byways of New York, and there are people that just want to drive scenic byways. And, you know, I would argue that all of our roads are scenic and byways here. So I just, I just wanted to list out, you know, kind of uh, items that are setting us up. Um, to help us reach those ecotourism goals. So we do have, you know, for anybody that doesn't know, we have over 350 miles of marked hiking trails in the Catskill Park proper. And then if you go out into the further regions, it's four to 500 miles of trails when you start adding it up. We also have miles of multi-use and accessible trails. We've got more of those coming online. I'm sure everybody's heard about the Ashokan Rail Trail. Um, these are all things, you know, people, I, I did a handout about the value of trails and um, I also have this if, if folks are interested. Uh, this is a report about the value of trails in America. It's not specific to New York, but it shows that something as simple as this 11 mile rail trail has the potential to revolutionize the economies along that way. I urge anybody who hasn't visited Poughkeepsie in many years, go visit Poughkeepsie at the end of the walkway over the Hudson now. And that has been able to revive Poughkeepsie in a way that decades of projects never was able to revive Poughkeepsie. Like, did people remember the main mall in Poughkeepsie and, and stuff like that that just failed miserably? But now you can walk the walkway over the Hudson, you can stop and have coffee, you can rent a bike. As we get rail trails like the Sashokan Rail Trail, there's going to be industry that's popping up around it because people are going to need bikes, people are going to need ice cream cones. I would be willing to bet sometime in the far distant future there'll be a trail between Kingston yeah. and Highmount. Part of the problem, though, is there are significant sections of the railroad that no longer exist. But they can, but they can start to start like that yes. for the miles, and then you have yes. another up here. Yes. The miles. Yes. You know, who's going to do right. 50 miles? Right. Well, but no, you, I mean, you say who will, but actually, like, there's, um, I, I, forgo yeah. I, I forgot the name of the trail, but there's a trail that runs from Washington, D.C. to, is it Pittsburgh or Philadelphia? Uh, whatever's on the other side of the mountains, the, the city that's on the other side of the mountains. It follows an old railroad. So it is, it is never more than 2% between Washington, D.C. and the city on the far side of the Appalachians. And it's like a 150-mile trail. And this is a huge destination because people will ride their bikes. They can ride maybe 20 miles a day. There's inns that have developed. There's been breakfasts. There's services that will like carry your stuff so you don't have to buy your stuff. So there's a whole economy that's built up around this trail. And if we had a trail, and you would, well, you'd, the, Virginia you'd Creeper trail. the Virginia Creeper Trail is the same way. And if we have a trail like this Ashokan Trail that say did someday go from Kingston to Highmount, which at High Mount, it would be able to connect with the Catskill Scenic Trail for another 30 miles. But um, is that going to connect to a So what I was going to say is, right? so that's going to connect. So the vision for the Hudson Valley is that we can become a rail trail destination. I don't know if people know that in the governor's or in the state budget this year, uh, there's funding for what the governor's calling the Empire State Trail, uh, which is a 760 mile multi-use trail that will go from New York City to the Canadian border and from Albany uh, or I guess from the Berkshires, uh, just across from Albany, all the way out to Buffalo. Um, and so we'll, re we'll interconnect with all these other existing rail trails. But the vision is somebody from New York City could take the train to Poughkeepsie. They can get off at Poughkeepsie. They're going to rent a bike. They're going to get up on the walkway. They're going to go out on the rail trails that are radiating from the walkway. Maybe they come over through New Paltz up, you know, the Wallkill Rail Trail. They come to Kingston. They get to Kingston. They spend the night in Kingston, they're like, oh my gosh, I can pedal another, I can pedal another 50 miles into the heart of the Catskill Mountains, but never more than 2%. Great. Um, it's, it's, it's an amazing... It's also spread right. out, so there's not yep. concentration of so many people. I live on Coldwell Road, which is the middle also, and the rail trail, the Ohio Trail, which is a great idea, but come 28A, the Five Arches Bridge, that section of the track, they wanted to bring a tourist ride in. Real explorers. 
Now on our road, which is about a mile and a half down to the end of the road, starting from 28, we have a residential community. Yeah, and, and I, I totally understand that, and I, I think that that's a great example of no, the challenges. Honest, no, but, no, no, no. When we talk about connecting yeah. the walking trail all the way up to Bel Air, you're walking through actually. Well, my house is on the but I would I would what but but what I would urge you to read this report because actually studies nationwide have shown that properties adjacent to rail trails um, or trails in general are actually more valuable. Your property value goes up, and yeah, and but I know that I as a person who grew up with people parking in my front yard, I totally I totally get it, and and that's a challenge because you know rail cars sound like an awesome idea. Do, you know, who wouldn't want to like hop on a little car and pedal and you know travel through the heart of the Catskills? Awesome, but then you hit reality. You're going to go through somebody's backyard. How are you going to work around that? And so, there's so many nuances. And you know, again, we have lots of nuances in the Catskills. I guess I would say, and 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 the sledgehammer approach does not work in the Catskills. Carbon tree. True. True. Well, yeah. So. Um, we now have the Catskill Interpretive Center, uh, which the Catskill Center is in the process of investing in to create a whole new uh, set of exhibits and information and uh, ways to get information out to people about recreation, about cultural resources, about all those kind of things. We're also seeing a big growth in four season recreation at the ski resorts. So it used to be in the summertime, you know, you went to Wyndham, there was nothing happening in the summertime, but now there's golf courses, there's mountain biking, uh, when a hunter has all these festivals, they, all, they used to have festivals more, but now there's even more festivals. Um, we're also becoming a mountain bike destination. Wyndham hosts the World Cup of mountain biking. Like, I, I, we, we accidentally went to dinner in Wyndham one night when it was the oh, World Cup, and I was like, nice. where are, you know, 10,000 people come to Wyndham to watch this World Cup. Um, incredible. Um, and also scenic byways. Um, you know, we, we are getting those, and those are things that people come. You know, they've got a guide to the scenic byway. They can experience it. They can see the businesses along it. And then I just wanted to also talk a little bit about um, sort of the intrinsic value of outdoor recreation and open space. So the Catskill Center did a study back in 2012 showing that outdoor recreation brought in, brought in 2.4 million visitors each year. Uh, the economic impact of those 2.4 million people was $114 million and represented 2,400 jobs here in the Catskills. Um, if you visit our website, catskillcenter.org, you can download the, the whole study that talks about that. Outdoor recreation nationwide, $646 billion, half a more than half a trillion dollars comes from outdoor recreation. Uh, you know, people going to REI and spending too much on a a backpack or you know also you know being out and about spending money when you go pay your day use fees things like that it has been shown that more than 47 percent of the people in the mid-atlantic region which is our region engage in outdoor activities uh, at least once a week so we have you know think of how many millions of people there are around us half of those people are engaging in outdoor activities and want outdoor activities um, and then Speaking in, in general tourism terms, about 15% of the Catskill workforce is, is uh, in jobs that are created by tourism. And the total tourism dollars in the Catskills uh, year to year is about a billion dollars, but I would be a little cautious about that number because they group the four counties together. And so I, I can see from the reports that Ulster County tends to skew the results because so Green, Delaware, Sullivan and Ulster. But Ulster has the gunks, it has, you know, they're not breaking it out regionally, they're just saying, these four counties are the Catskills. So, but between those four counties, there's a billion dollars in tourism money every year. Um, which is huge, you know, think. Um, and this is kind of going back to reconnect to, to the, the ecotourism concepts. How can we create ways that our communities can benefit from this tourism? Because I think we can all agree that we're not doing a very good job right now of helping communities. There are some that are doing okay, but we don't have any, any communities that are like, gosh, we've got too much business, 
you know, we don't need that. Part of it is connecting Main Street, I say to the trails, but connecting Main Street to the open space around it. How many towns do you go into and you're in that, that community and you know that the Catskill Park is around you, but you're like, how the heck do I get on a trail? How the heck do I go fish in the river? Um, there's no direct connection. And that direct connection could just be a kiosk in, in downtown saying, you know, here are places to go to do these things. Or it can actually be bringing those recreational resources into the community. So like in Margaretville, you're on the river. Um, you know, there are opportunities uh, to m walk people from Main Street right to the river. Um, there's other communities where trails do sort of traverse and, you know, are around the community. Well, instead of avoiding the community with the trails, why don't we just bring the trail right into the... I think these two, creating opportunities to drive visitors to business and new transportation solutions, go hand in hand. One of the things we hear the most from people visiting the Catskills is how hard it is to get around. Um, I was amazed when I worked for the trail conference how many calls I would get from people who were like, I'm flying into New York City, I don't want to rent a car, but I want a vacation in the Catskills, or I want to hike the Devil's Path, what do I do? And I would be like, all right, well, you've got to go to Penn Station, you've got to get on a bus, you've got to go to Kingston, you've got to then change the bus to go into this, and then you get this, and then when you get off here in, in Hunter, call Smiley's Transport, because they'll know what you are, because you're a hiker, just tell them you're a hiker and you want to hike the Devil's Path. You know, and that is just not the way to, you know, you are all confused already. Um, that's not the way to cater to businesses. So things that the Catskill Center is working on with, with other organizations and with other communities, uh, we're trying to find, you know, are there solutions in shuttles? Uh, the Caterskill Clove area, chronic problem area, many other chronic problem areas, maybe Blue Hole. Um, but the town of Hunter and the town of Catskill want to work together where they want to create parking lots in Palinville and in Tannersville that you basically, there will be no parking in the Clove. There will only be parking in those two, two communities. You then have to go onto Main Street and you have to buy a shuttle ticket at some Main Street, each, every Main Street business will sell tickets, but you gotta buy a ticket in Main Street and maybe you'll buy a hot dog while you're in there. Um, and then when you're on the shuttle, people like me can stand on that shuttle and lecture you about you know, how, to, how to do good by the cat skills. Um, so these, these are things that we're thinking about. Um, thinking about instead of opening a business that you wanna open, but, you know, for lack of a better term, opening businesses that are catering to the, the people that are coming here. Um, so for the New York City reservoirs, you've got to steam clean your boat. Um, and as boating becomes more popular, there's probably going to be more opportunities to open places. I know it has, it's been a bit of a struggle uh, to date, but, you know, you would think that over time as these opportunities grow, you know, you need more people to steam clean boats or you need more people to sell shoelaces that, you know, when your hiking boot shoelaces break or, uh, I often joke at my parents' place on the trail there that I want to open Last Chance Sports and charge like five dollars for the, the you know the forgotten battery or whatever it is because people are you know we've got a captive audience here in the Catskills that that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, thinking both locally and regionally, we're very good at thinking locally here in the Catskills, and and every community thinks of like what's in it for me, um, but we're very bad at thinking regionally and not thinking in a zero sum game. Um, so a benefit to the community here is also a benefit to the community down the road. Um, and it can be a hard sell for communities to understand that. Uh, when we opened the Catskill Interpretive Center, I was honestly surprised that some communities were concerned that the Interpretive Center with its very small gift shop and stuff that was happening was going to be stealing business from communities. And I said, no, no, the, the Interpretive Center is the gateway, we, you know, we want your stuff here so that we can send people out to your communities. We're never going to be the one-stop shop for everything Catskill, you know. We're, we're a tool to get people to you. Um, and maybe we have an event, but people are going to come to our event and then they're going to go out and explore the Catskills. Walk in, walk out, right, right, I, uh, um, Strong virtual and physical presences. Another thing that shocked me when I started the Interpretive Center um, I'm bound by certain rules because I'm working with the state for the Interpretive Center. Um, so I can't promote individual businesses. So if Joe's Fly Shop wants to advertise, I have to say, no, you know, I can't accept your thing. But if there is a guide to fly fishing shops in the Catskills, I can put the guide to fly fishing shops out. 
So I would have a ton of communities come in and they're like, well, why can't I put you know, Joe's Bed and Breakfast brochures from my community in here? And I said, well, no, I can't do that, but if you create your community brochure, I can put it in. And you know, there was only one or two towns that actually had a brochure for their town or a website for their town that was like, here's what's happening in our town. Um, so the fact that we have an interpretive center and it has this weird rule about you know, brochures has actually made towns work together or the people in the town work together to create a single brochure for the town. Um, you know, Andy's has a brochure now, Phoenicia has a brochure, Tannersville has a brochure, several others have brochures, so. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> please work together. Um, learning to take advantage. Um, one thing that another, another, I guess I'm constantly surprised if you listen to me saying that I'm constantly surprised. Um, how much both organizations here in the Catskills and communities in the Catskills think that they are the only ones having problems. Um, and so they try to solve the problem from scratch. Um, and there are plenty of places other than the Catskills that have had problems with, uh, you know, chronic, chronic um, rural underdevelopment and underfunding um, with high tourism things. And they've been able to solve the problems. Uh, some that are worse off than the Catskills. Like exactly. There are other places that have. But well, off the top of my head, I. Okay, I'm, I but, but yes, there. You know, I think there are. It, pretty much every problem we have, there's good examples and there's bad examples of how people have tackled it elsewhere. And my point here is not to necessarily take advantage of any single thing, but just realize that you don't have to invent the wheel every time. You know, we shouldn't be inventing the wheel, it's a waste of resources. We're great at writing reports here and then rewriting the same report 10 years later. Um, and then how, how do we create these regenerative systems that feed back into the park and into our communities? And I think this is probably one of the hardest things because you know, in a, in a region of limited means, everybody kind of wants to do the best for themselves, but part of ecotourism is figuring out how do we do well for our people, but also at the same time do well for the natural area. And I don't necessarily have an answer to that right now, but it's something that, that needs to be considered. Um, and then, so, you know, as we saw, we're not very close to these, but what are ways that we can do, or, or the things that we can do in order to get closer to ecotourism as a concept here in the Catskills? Well, minimizing impact, <coughs> we are starting to have the tools with the Interpretive Center, with this Leave No Trace effort at Blue Hole, uh, the Hike Safe program, other programs, shuttles where we, you know, sort of bombard people with environmental messages. Uh, all these things are ways to educate visitors both while they're here and even more importantly like going into the communities where these people are coming from, educating the communities about the importance of taking care of the cat skills. Building environmental and cultural awareness. Um, again, it's that education, but it's also utilizing existing resources and, and taking those things so um, you know, people, people are using Smiley's Transport. Why aren't we working with Smiley's Transport to fix something in the cab that's talking about, you know, why you should care about the Catskills? Um, you know, I think people, people often, if you, unless they are told something is important or that something doesn't just come for free or doesn't take any effort, they just assume that it's free and that it takes no effort. So the more that we can find places to, to generate that feeling, the, the better. Um, providing positive experiences for visitors and hosts. Um, I think we are starting to see more positive experiences for hosts and visitors, and that's really because we're starting to adjust to uh, what tourism and visitors are expecting here in the Catskills. So like I said, you can have dinner on a Tuesday night in the Catskills now. Um, places are posting hours. Um, you can visit a website and you can see a menu. Um, because I know a lot of people that are not from around here, like if they can't pull up a menu on their phone, they won't go to a place. They're like, I don't, I don't know what's going to be at that restaurant and if I'm going to like it or not. And you know, if you're running a, a restaurant here in the Catskills, would that be something that would enter your consciousness? Well, well, a good example with this would be to, to be aware of the traffic of visitors. So like, you know, this year is the winter time. This year it goes at four. So that four to six time frame, you're going to have that traffic leaving all those 
you know, and if you're a business along that route, to be open during that time frame. Yeah. Or like Sunday nights, people are all, you know, a mass of people are evacuating the Catskills at like 6 o'clock at night. Yeah, so or... Being flexible to... You know... You know the actually, they leave at 2 sometimes. They're on their way down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or we started selling ski tickets at the Interpretive Center this winter, and about halfway through the winter, we realized, why aren't we selling any Bel Air tickets? We're selling lots of Hunter and we're selling lots of Wyndham tickets. Um, but people that would be skiing at Bel Air, that would be driving up 28, that would probably be like, oh, I can get a discounted ticket on the fly. At 9.30, they're already at Bel Air. And that's when the Interpretive Center opens. Um, so we were like, oh, for next winter, maybe we open it at 8.30 on, on weekdays. Um, but the other, mount, like, the other mountains, I think it's because they're out and about. And they're like, oh, I can get cheaper tickets and I can use them anytime. But the Bel Air people, you know, so it's understanding those ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. um, those direct benefits to conservation, um, figuring out how to get around forever wild protections, and uh, that sounds really schemey, and I, 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 it shouldn't be schemey, but you know, figuring out ways to, to, re, to, to, to bring funding back into the park uh, that benefits it through conservation projects, um, things like the Catskill Conservation Corps getting volunteers out and about. Um, and then also uh, figuring out how to empower local businesses. So, um, you know, we're doing a good job at getting money for the park, but, you know, we need to do a, a good job at getting money to support local businesses and stuff because it is a tough climate. You know, there's, there's a certain amount of, of chance and luck and also um, a lack of sort of support in general here in our communities makes it tough for them. Um, and then finally, you know, I just wanted to close with how is the Catskill Center helping in this regard? Uh, like I said, we are uh, operating and managing the Catskill Interpretive Center. Um, we are doing our best to educate visitors there. We're working with a variety of partners. Um, we're uh, increasing the, uh, the exhibit space and the information that's being presented there. Uh, we continue to do a lot of work. Uh, probably a third of my job is related to advocacy um, of just having those conversations. and. I say advocacy, but that's, that's a, that can be me meeting with someone from an agency saying, why don't we have a sign yet? Or that can be me knocking on a legislator's door saying, you know, you really should support the Catskills in the budget uh, and everything in between. Um, coalition building uh, goes hand in hand with advocacy. I think that the reason, one of the reasons we saw great progress for funding in the Catskill Park is because the Catskill Park Coalition is growing, mm -hmm. but also, you know, some people may like the Bel Air funding, some people may not like the Bel Air funding, but the fact that when the governor announced $20 million for Gore and Whiteface and conveniently forgot the I Catskills. He did. Well, he claims he did not. I asked Kathy Nolan. I don't well, believe. Yeah. Do you think he really did? Because the next thing I heard, he, he didn't. Well, but what, let me tell you what, what happened was the entire Catskills raised a ruckus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Catskill Center included saying, what gives? You're, you're giving Orta facilities in the Adirondacks $20 million and you're not giving anything to the Catskills. And then suddenly, oh, I, we meant to announce this, this $8 million for the Catskills, but you know what? I got plenty of emails and notes from, from people that, that won't be named that said, you know, you know, good job getting folks to, to all talk with one voice to say the Catskills are worthwhile to do it because otherwise, they may or may not have. But there's a problem because Bel Air has never made a profit. That's true. So why are you investing in new ski lifts when there's no more snow going to be here and they don't make a profit? That's the problem. What but I would also to say all that season, what all season, which it, is, it is becoming an all-season resort. Part of that money is to develop a mountain biking plan no. and a cross-country ski plan on the shoulder of of Bel Air that's that will be lift serve, so you'll have lift serve mountain biking seasons, trails. But, uh, you know, you have other so that's a four season thing. You know, I think, I think that yes, Bel Air is is not necessarily the greatest example of money making. But if Bel Air was to disappear, what would happen to the economy of the Central Catskills? It would, it would, well, it would. Why is, if, if nothing, if they have never made money for? But they haven't made money because they don't have to make money. They're a state facility. You know, it's, 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 you but know, they're not. They make money, it's more tax dollars than we have. Every dollar that they make there yeah. just goes into the general fund again. It doesn't come back to Bel Air. So they have no, 
no incentive to make more money, you know? Um, yep. Um, so, on, so just to what you said, and the fact of um, you know, not recreating the wheel, what other areas um, parks have mastered how to bring money back to conservation? Like, what's above? I mean, from parking meters or from you know, it's tax on the business? Parking meters, but it's also like businesses taking advantage of the resource. Um, so like when you see the people that are doing the, um, you know, the tree walks and stuff like that, they're paying a lot of money to, to have this experience. A certain aspect is just going into the business and, and being profit for the business owner. But a certain amount of that money is going back to, you know, the National Park Service that, you know, and I, don't, I, I don't know exactly what the intergovernmental partnerships are there, say in like Costa Rica or something, but money is going back into that resource so that, the damage that's happening from that activity is being mitigated, and also that you know the park itself is being expanded, or that there's more restoration, or that there's more protection, or there's more money for science. There's no um, avenue in the Catskills for that, right? It's kind of not applicable because of our sort of. It's challenging. It's an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> you don't feel that. Maybe there would be some wisdom in putting the brakes on this tourist development while we try and catch up with an understanding of how to not turn the place into a circus. Exactly. I just, I don't, unfortunately, think, you know, in, in all those, 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 uh, those places, we've been a tourist destination since the 1820s. People know about the Catskills. Social media can't be turned off. Um, there's so many reasons why, and they're going to come. And so, you know, we can, we can. The answer is to take all the advertising money from the Isle of New York campaign because social media is doing it anyway. Right. Right. And and that's that's one of our advocacy arguments. So, I think we're we're up for time. I just want to thank Jeff for sharing his time today. Yes. Thank. Thank. Thank you all for coming out. <laughs>